Okay, good morning, everyone. It's truly wonderful once again to come to the house of the Lord to worship. Um, today is the first Sunday of the month. Uh, just just uh, information, there will be no loss after this Sunday because we were having one uh, meaningful one on Friday, for Good Friday. So we will have the Lord's Supper on Friday instead. So um, I, I just want to quickly... Read this psalm, uh, sorry, this, this uh, passage in Mark chapter 11, verses 9 to 10. And it says, And those who went before and those who followed were shouting. So these people were following Jesus. And they were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. So our theme is praising the Lord. Um, Hosanna in the highest. Obviously, even on Sunday school, we talk about David being the um, forefathers in sense of, of the lineage of Jesus Christ, right? Um, so, so this is uh, what we are celebrating today as we celebrate Palm Sunday that's coming up. Um, and we want to truly thank our Lord Jesus for what he has done for us and is complete. So thank you very much. Um, and I would like to invite Brad Joshua to lead us this morning. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So as many of you would know, today is Palm Sunday. Uh, We're commemorating the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem in his final week of ministry before his uh, crucifixion and his resurrection. So uh, please stand with me as we sing hymn number 38. This will be found on your hymnals in front of you. Hymn number 38, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Sorry? 36, yeah.
you open your Bibles back to 2 Corinthians and the 8th chapter, uh, as you know, we began our exposition in uh, this passage last week, and uh, we completed the first paragraph in the first seven verses, and this morning uh, we'll give our attention to the next paragraph, beginning in verse 8. Uh, right down through the 15th verse. So our reading will begin in verse 1 all the way to verse 15 of 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We read responsively uh, and uh, we'll proceed uh, in that fashion. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, the Apostle Paul says in verse 1, We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. Verse 3. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urge Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich and in this manner i give my judgment this benefits you who a year ago started not only to do this work but also to desire to do it so now finish doing it as well so that your readiness in desiring it may be matched by your completing it out of what you have for if the readiness is there it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but that as a matter of fairness, your abundance at this present time should supply their need, so that their abundance may supply your need, that there may be fairness. As it is written, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. Let's go to our Lord in prayer this morning to commemorate his entrance into the city of Jerusalem. Triumphal entry. Heavenly Father, even as we enter into what is known as the Holy Week, we would envision the throng of crowd that has gathered there in the gates of Jerusalem and in the midst of all that is happening, our Lord summoning the two disciples to go into the village and finding this donkey tied and um, with the colt and bring it to him fulfilling what Zechariah the prophet says say to the daughter of Zion behold your king is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey on a colt the foal of a beast of burden and the crowd lining up this lining the street cutting palm branches and spreading them on the road 
and shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Save now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. What a sight it is to behold on that day. This grand entrance that the crowd would give to our Lord. Certainly he is the king, but his kingdom is not a political one or else his followers would fight. But his kingdom is a heavenly one. It is a spiritual one. And he comes as the great king of kings. And just as we have read in the second psalm yesterday, in our scripture reading, this one who shall come and the kings of this earth rage. But yet, the God of heavens laughs. There is absolutely no comparison. The power of our great and mighty king. And the kings who, in our world today, would flex their muscle their military might, their economic might, displaying to one another in an act of one-upmanship, who is stronger? And our God in heaven laughs. In one fell swoop, he would destroy all of the so-called mighty weapons of destruction of mankind, the weapons that men in their ingenuity uh, minds would come up with. And so, Father, it behooves us to bow our knees to this great King, that we might humble ourselves and submit to his kingship in our lives to do his bidding. And who would imagine that this one mounted on a donkey, uh, not a steed, would come in and in just a few short days, mounts the cross. And, O oh Lord, you would then in this week display and exemplify servanthood, washing your disciples' dirty, dusty feet, and then telling us to follow suit. And such is the, is the example of servant leadership. And Lord, we would do well to contemplate this week on all that our Lord has done, really leading up to what he called the hour. And finally, the hour has come. The hour that would change the course of history. The hour that really is the culmination of all our Lord's earthly work. The hour that is the climax of the Heavenly Father's plan to redeem mankind from their sin. <coughs> that is the hour that although most would have no eyes to see nor a heart to desire would come, yet that is the hour that would come where our Lord Jesus Christ would submit to all the Lord's will in this regard 
and joyfully going to the cross and doing this so that we might be liberated from the prison of sin. O oh Lord, our hearts are filled with great joy in this regard. May we never get over it. May we never ever get tired of thinking about this plan, this glorious plan, our God, who is rich in mercy by his great love with which he loved us, saved us. And may we ever be ready to proclaim this good news to those around us. Because who can keep this good news to themselves? We can but do nothing but share this great hope of mankind. So, Father, we pray this week, even as we contemplate on all of what you have done for us, we pray that you would bring our heart great rejoicing of all the good that has been done in this greatest of all demonstration of love. So, Father, fill our hearts with great joy, knowing that the work didn't end on Friday. It continues through to the resurrection of our Lord on the first day of the week and all leading up to that triumphant moment where the head of the serpent is crushed. So, Father, we pray that you help us to meditate on these things that we truly might give you Great praise and thanksgiving for all they have done for us. For in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Our next hymn echoes this, um, the spirit of the, uh, this song. So the next hymn can be found in the hymnal in front of you. This is hymn number 41. Blessed be the name. We'll remain seated for this hymn. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. 
Thank you, Brother Joshua. I just wonder how many of us know the meaning of Hosanna. I mean, we talk about Hosanna, we read the Bible about Hosanna, our theme is Hosanna. Does anybody know or do not know the meaning of Hosanna? Actually, if I'm not wrong, it is just an expression uh, of praise and joy of our Lord Jesus uh, for what he has done. So we can always, you know, just shout out Hosanna. It's, it, it's wonderful because it's an expression of your joy of what the Lord has done for us. Um, and now we just want to, as part of our giving, it's also an expression of this joy. Um, it's not something that the church instituted. It is what the Bible have given us example of it. So let us give thanks to God as an expression of this joy as we pray for what he has done for us. Dear Lord, our Father in heaven, we thank you. Thank you that we can shout out Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Because indeed it is so. Who can be higher than you? For you have said, you own everything. You own a cattle of a thousand hills. And you own our lives because of what you have done for us. Without you being on the cross, Lord, our lives is worthless. But now we have been justified by you, Lord. Father, we want to just show the expression of our praise and thanksgiving through this giving. We thank you, Lord, for all that you have given us. In fact, you withhold nothing from us. And we lack nothing as we read today in 2 Corinthians. So, Lord, thank you. Thank you for the generosity of your saints whose giving has helped in many ways in this church over the years. Not just on the upkeeping of the church, but also, most importantly, to support our missionaries across many countries. We want to thank you. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to be part of the work in the mission field. So thank you, and we want to pray and ask all this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen.
All right, so the children, are there any children to dismiss right now? Yeah, the children will be dismissed after the first stanza. Our final hymn before the message is All Glory, Lord, and Honor. You'll find this on your hymnal, um, and it's hymn number 11, hymn number 11. Uh, may we please rise to sing this last final hymn before the message? <coughs> this to be Palm Sunday, that is a designation given to what happened uh, the week before our Lord went to the cross, and therefore you have uh, Good Friday coming up, and given the occasion, we would think that it's fitting for us to partake of the Lord's table uh, on uh, this Good Friday instead of today. Today is the first Lord's Day of the month, usually we partake of the Lord's table. I think it's very fitting that we move that then to uh, this coming Friday. I think uh, everything, all of, the, all of the events that has taken place really fits into the symbolism given to us uh, in the elements um, of the Lord's table. So uh, we will have the Lord's table this coming um, Friday. Our service will begin at 10 in the morning uh, and um, uh, would uh, love for you to join and for you to bring uh, your friends as well. If you'll take your Bibles back to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and we began this... Uh, our exposition of 2 Corinthians, uh, returning back to where we last left off end of last year, at the end of the seventh chapter, 
And so we are carrying on in the eighth chapter. And um, it is regarding the topic of giving. Uh, I mentioned this last week, and I would say it again, that that is, uh, I don't ever preach about giving, even though in the past I've been encouraged to do so. When our giving is down, usually is when we were, you know, the, there's uh, some of the, some of the, 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 the need to do that uh, by uh, an encouragement by probably the deacons in the past. But I've never really felt um, that it's my place to do so for the reasons I gave last week. And really, the only reason why I'm doing this is because uh, this is the next part of our exposition, exposition of uh, this passage. I've given you the reasons last week why I don't preach on giving. Um, no doubt, at the back of people's mind, all right, uh, there is some kind of self-gain to be had, uh, given how my remuneration is tied to, uh, the, uh, to the church um, and maybe in some way uh, affected uh, by the level of giving. So I never ever want to give any kind of false impression that uh, that is uh, the motive behind. So I never ever preach about that um, in this uh, particular setting. Um, and then obviously, you know, uh, we are not a prosperity gospel church. Uh, we, don't, we don't teach that because you give to the Lord, He will return you a hundredfold. Uh, we don't see that in scripture uh, of that guarantee. And, uh, and I think in Singapore, we have seen that churches who does that, churches who do that, um, some of them realize that, that now they have a, a big pool of money in their account, what, what do they do with that? And um, I guess the sky's the limit in terms of what kind of a shell company you set up and businesses you set up and all that, and you transfer money from one pocket to another and all that, and uh, it becomes a real problem. In any case, the Lord has saw fit to meet the church's need faithfully through thick and thin. Every week you see what is the level of giving in our church and, um, you know, that is really all, you know, that we do uh, in terms of any kind of encouragement uh, given to you. But given how now we are in this passage, uh, uh, we have an opportunity to look at what the Bible teaches about giving. We saw last week that Paul describes the enthusiastic and sacrificial giving of the Macedonians as an evidence of God's grace at work in their life and as a mark of God's ownership of their lives and possession. You see there in verse eight, chapter, chapter 8, verse 1, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God. Paul describes our generous giving as the grace of God, and he gives the example of the Macedonians. What were they like? Well, in verse 2, we see that they are in a severe test of affliction. They are being persecuted for their faith. But... You see that, regardless of that, they were displaying abundance of joy. And in their extreme poverty, they have become, that even in those states of persecution, of extreme poverty, they gave generously. Right? Some people say, oh, you know, I don't have much right now, so I can't give, but if I have more, I will give in the future. Well, if you don't have much and you don't give, who knows whether you will when you have a lot. And the Macedonians' example, they gave generously out of their extreme poverty. And as a result, Paul testified that some even gave beyond their means. In other words, they may gain so much that they may even wonder whether they can afford the next meal. I think none of us really in our situation in Singapore uh, would worry about our next meal. But for those in extreme poverty, they gave, and, and, and look at how enthusiastic they were in their giving. Uh, here in verse 3, Right? They give of their own means, even beyond their means. In verse 4, begging us earnestly for the favour. And the word favour is that same word as the word grace. 
to take part in the relief of the saints in the church in Jerusalem. These Jewish believers in Jerusalem who are suffering from poverty. And the basis by which they can do that is really they know that they belong to the Lord. Look at verse 5. They gave themselves first to the Lord and if they belong to the Lord, therefore, by extension, everything they have belongs to the Lord. So what is it? You know, if the Lord wants everything, is all, it all belongs to Him anyways, why should I be grasping? Right, so this is a remarkable example that Paul is bringing up of, of, of these saints uh, in these churches in Macedonia. They are the church of Philippi, uh, and also Thessalonica, and also uh, in Berea as well. And so in returning back to uh, the Corinthians, Paul says that um, they should complete this collection in verse 6. And since they excel so wonderfully in so many different things, in faith, and speech, and knowledge, in all earnestness, in love, see that you excel in this act of grace. This act of grace referring to what? Of giving. Alright, so here Paul continues in verse in chapter eight and in verse eight with regards to what we can call gospel fuel giving. You will see soon why it is called gospel fuel giving. By saying in in chapter in verse eight that our giving ought not be coerced but be done in love. Look at verse eight. I say this not as a command. In other words, our giving is entirely voluntary. And once again, Paul speaks very cautiously. We mentioned this last week. He clarifies himself, lest the Corinthian believers think that he's commanding them to give, that he's forcing them to give, that he's pressurizing them to give, that he's demanding them to give. No, no. Uh, once again, Paul is displaying that leaders are not domineer over the people that they're leading. In the case of giving, Paul is saying that it is totally up to the Corinthians' discretion. It doesn't take long for a leader to realize that the people don't like to be told what to do. And, uh, and uh, obviously, uh, in cases where clear scripture is violated, the leader must speak clearly and warn against disobedience. But... A leader is always evaluating whether the matter is one of preference or scriptural importance. And that is, what evalu uh, that is when evaluating anything, we must ask, what does the Bible say about this? Does the Bible have very clear scripture about this particular matter that we're discussing? And that's why Paul prays that we might have a spirit of discernment. He prays in Philippians chapter 1, verse 9 to 11, it is my prayer that you are loving about more and more with knowledge and all discernment so you may approve what is excellent and so that you may be pure and blameless for the day of, of Christ. In other words, you know, we are always not just thinking about doing what is just right, just differentiate between what is right and wrong. We are thinking, is this the best? Is this the most wise decision? So, once again, we, have saw, we saw last week, Scripture emphasizes joyful, willing, voluntary giving. And as a genuine apostle of Christ, Paul has every prerogative to command them to give. In fact, it is much easier for him to just tell them what to do. Just, 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 just do this. And it's actually much harder to reason with them that they take ownership of the decision that is really, Paul is actually, you know, putting the ball on their court and they have to make the call. Now, what should I do? Should I give? Should I not give? If I do give, how much do I give? So that is all the, the decision and the discretion of the Corinthian believers. But he says, continue in verse 8, but to prove, and what prove there is test, by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. In other words, our giving is evidence of love. That's why we often you have this term, right? Love give. Love give. That is correct. And the word proof is the word test. Our giving is a test of whether our love is genuine. 
is one of the ways. I shouldn't say it's the only way. It's one of the ways whether our love is genuine. And remember, maybe this attitude of love is lacking in the Corinthians. And remember, in the previous book, he wrote one entire chapter describing what true love looks like. Okay? And when these people give, who are they showing? They're showing love, but who are they showing love to? Certainly to the Lord Jesus Christ first. Paul says in chapter 5, verse 14, that the love of Christ controls us. But certainly, when you give, it is also showing love to other believers. Paul says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Alright, so we are to do good, especially to those who are believers. Uh, you see a reference there on first, in 1 John 2, verse 10 and 11. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. You know, people say this, you know, some people say this, you ask them, why don't they go to church? They say, oh, I love Jesus, I just don't like Christians. Wait a minute. If you love your brother in Christ, here we are talking about brothers in Christ, you abide in the light. But if you hate your brother, you are in darkness and you walk in darkness. So there's no such thing as loving God but not loving other Christians because, you know, they're annoying, they're so hypocritical. They are, sure. I mean, it doesn't take long for you to realize that there are all these uh, annoying traits, traits of all these people. It is like people in your family, you know, because why? The church is a family. You will see annoying stuff. You, you, people will offend you. They will say stuff without thinking and they may annoy you. But Remember, love operates in just such an environment, which is why Paul says, what is the first thing he says about love? Love suffereth long and is kind. Why do you need to suffer long? Because you, you love the person so much, that's why you need to suffer long with it. No, no, no. Love suffers long because why? You have to put up with his annoyances. All right? You have siblings. You have great with siblings. You parents, do you have uh, issues with your, with, your, with your children, with sibling rivalry and all that kind of thing? Especially on Sunday mornings, getting ready to go to church. I'm sure none of that happens, right? It never happens, you know, only to my family. Yeah, that's, what, that's, that's how it is. And that's where love operates. I like to distinguish with uh, the couples that I do, marriage counselling, between romantic feelings and love. Folks, do you realise there are two different things? All right? Nothing wrong with romantic feelings. It's what brings the couple together. But as you know, romantic feelings wane over time. And then you start to see, wow, how can you so annoying like that? Uh? And now see, when we are dating, you now do this thing. But now, now you know, uh -uh. that is where now you exercise biblical love. Love suffers long and is kind. All right? So, uh, but, but the world confuses both, all right? They, they, they say romantic feeling is love and love is romantic feeling. No, they're not, they're not the same. Love operates in an environment when you are frustrated and you're angry and you're annoyed at this person or whatever it may be, all right? Can you understand that? I'm trying to speak with my lips locked, jaws locked. But that's what it is. That is what it is. And Paul is saying that one way by which you show love is, you know, to meet the needs of those who have needs in this way. So our, ge uh, our generosity, especially towards believers in need, is an evidence of our love, a supernatural love by the grace of God. And really giving is this tangible love in action. So while Paul brought up the example of the Macedonian believers, he's going to bring up the ultimate example of giving. So he talked about the Macedonians, right, in earlier on. Now, the ultimate example. And who is the ultimate example? Well, none other than our Lord Jesus Christ. It is one thing to describe the practical attitudes of the Macedonian believers. And yes, they are very sacrificial. They are, very, they are, they are such a good example. But really... 
pales, the example pales in comparison to our Lord Jesus Christ. And notice what he says here in verse 9. For you know that the grace, and once again, the word grace appears here, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. First of all, Notice that we have experienced the lavish grace of Christ. Right? We see here, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Well, one commentator described this way. It denotes the utterly undeserved, royally free, effective, unwearying, inexhaustible goodwill of God, active in and through Jesus Christ. God's effective, overflowing mercy. And you know what? If you're a believer here this morning, you have experienced that. Paul's point is that we are all beneficiaries of such undeserved grace. So how can we, true believers, shut our hearts and wallets in this, in the, in the, in this context to brothers and sisters in need? Uh, a cross-reference is 1 John 3, 16 to 18. Not John 3, 16, but 1 John 3, 16. By this we know love, that Jesus laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods, meaning material wealth, and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him. How does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. That's a good, you want to put this cross-reference there, 1 John 3, 16 to 18, next to this verse. I think it's good. I think it's a very good um, cross-reference. It's very direct, all right, in showing that, okay, we who have experienced Christ's love ought to show that to others as well in terms of generosity. Therefore, because God has lavishly provided us His grace and because of the depths of Christ's sacrifice for us, we should be generous to others as well. And you know what? In doing so, we become what, what the Bible says, <coughs> we are godly. All right? And this is how God is, and we become Christ-like because this is what Christ is. He gave of himself, and once again, it's timely. On Good Friday, we will commemorate that. But also in the second part of verse 9, now look at the example of Christ. Though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so you by his poverty might become rich. Um. And the cross reference here is very clearly Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 11. Let's just turn there for a moment because uh, we are going to be... And, and this is right along the lines of what we are thinking about this Holy Week, right? So Paul says, Have this mind among yourselves, Second, uh, this is Philippians 2, verse 5, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. That's what the emptying refers to. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Right? That is what has happened. And that is what Jesus has done. He has taken on the form of a servant. The word is doulos, meaning slave. A slave owns, owns little or nothing. Now, some people would interpret, back to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, that here Paul is referring to Christ's material poverty. All right? So, because he became materially poor so that you by his poverty might become materially rich. Okay? And so they take this verse to say, okay, you know, uh, it is God's will for you to have a lot of money and a lot of material wealth because, uh, you know, look, this is what Jesus has done for you. 
In other words, <laughs> Jesus died on the cross for you so that you can be, you have a lot of money in your bank. Uh, just think about that. It's almost blasphemous. It's almost blasphemous. If that is the case, how can we explain the situation of the Macedonians? Paul says that they were in extreme poverty. The riches here obviously refers to not just riches in the material realm, but it refers to spiritual riches. If you cross-reference this back to Philippians chapter 2, I mean, how can you interpret what Jesus did in Philippians 2 as in Him dying on the cross to make you rich physically? The riches has to be spiritually, spiritual riches. That is why Jesus says that while the church in Smyrna last week is materially poor, yet He says that they are rich. No, 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 no. They, they have no money. Uh, uh, why would Jesus say that they are rich? No, no, no. He's referring to their spiritual riches. In fact, riches here, this riches here in verse 9, that you might be rich, refers to ultimately what is the most valuable. What, when you put a fire on it, will never destroy. All right? You put fire to all these material wealth, they will all burn up. But it is spiritual riches that is ultimately valuable, not economic riches. You know, I wonder how a pastor who is going through this passage would preach it, and it's different if it's a different, different country. Let's say, let's, let's say he is in a majority world country. You know what a majority world country is? It used to be called third world, but we don't call it third world anymore. Not, not politically correct. Majority world. How would they preach this? Uh, we won't say Singapore is in that category. By far, it's not in that category. Any of us, regardless of what is our income level, would find ourselves really in the top tier of wealth in compared to any country in the world. So sometimes I think, you know, we, 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 we come to passages like this, you know, and all that. Uh, I, I do wonder what we, how we will receive such the teaching. Uh, some of us, okay, so I was reading this book, and this book was describing our former Prime Minister, Lee Kuan Yew, and how he brought our country from third world to first world. So, you know, some probably came from the background, you, you would say that when you were growing up, your parents were poor. So you do come from a majority world country, and you understand what that poverty is. Uh, but I think, you know, I would love to hear stories if you have any, or testimony. You know, just even, even in those situations, how the Lord has met needs. Whether it is in your church back home, right, uh, or, or whatever. Um, and that how, you know, uh, the Lord has really provided but here, Jesus, in verse 1 commentator, chose the poverty of human existence so that through his poverty, he could impart the eternal riches of redemption to the poverty of all for whose sake he became poor. The eternal riches of redemption. And the way he imparts these unsearchable riches is by going to the cross and offering himself as the ultimate sacrifice for our sin. For our sin. So we put our trust in Jesus and turn away from our sin, we receive Jesus' unsearchable riches of salvation. This is most valuable. But the result of our salvation transforms the way we share our material wealth, material riches. So if we have already received what is ultimately the most valuable thing anyone can ever get, then what is merely economic riches? Someone says the self-emptying of Christ for Christians should lead them to empty their pocketbooks for others, if only in proportion to what they have. That was a good quote. The sacrifice of Jesus is then our ultimate motive for giving. 
So once again, you see that you know there is Paul goes back and forth, all right, describing material giving, material wealth, material riches, and spiritual riches. In fact, we are going to continue to see this uh, coming on later on uh, in, in this particular passage. So our giving is related to the grace of God that we as spiritually needy beggars experience in Christ. So after giving the, tr- the ultimate example, Paul returns to some more of his counsel to the people. So what is he going to say? Look at verse 10. He says, In this matter I gave my judgment. All right? This benefits you, who a year ago started on, uh, not only to do this work, but also to desire to do it. So now finish doing it as well, so that your readiness or your willingness in desiring it may be matched by your completing it out of what you have. For if the willingness is there, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. Okay, so these uh, uh, verse 10, 11, and 12 come out, kind of go together. And what we can say here is that our giving ought to be marked by eager willingness. The term that he uses here is the word readiness. Be ready to do this. So, uh, Paul now gives some encouragement. All right? When he says, in this matter, I give my judgment, he is saying, given the circumstances, I think this best. Once again, he's not ordering them to do anything. He's not commanding to do anything. Uh, he's just saying, okay, I, 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 in my judgment, I think this best. Okay? What is best? Well, first of all, that their good intentions must result in action. Okay, look at verse 10. He praises them for their desires to do it. Your desires, you desire to do this. Okay? But good and noble desires alone are not enough, right? They have to be followed up with action. Okay, Paul was very, he was employing his interpersonal skills, is that what you call it? Soft skills, all right? Uh, if you are a Singaporean, you will say this, talk is cheap, let's show some action. Uh, this is actually, it's actually what Paul is saying here, but in a very nice way, in a very nice way, okay? Uh, Paul is subtly communicating that, hey, let's not just talk about it and say that you have desire to do this, let's actually show by action, Okay? You know, right? When people say a lot of things and all that, I want to do this, I want to do that, and all that, but they never do anything. All right? Only talk only. Uh, they call it what? NATO, right? No action, talk only. Is that what? It is? Just kidding. Okay. So, uh, uh, Paul says that it is in their best interest to finish what they have begun. It does nothing good for their reputation to communicate their intention to contribute uh, to the needy Jerusalem believers if that intention doesn't materialize into action. That's what we want to see, action, right? And then in verse 11, all right, so that's what he says in verse 10, okay, finish it up. So now in verse 10, verse 11, so now finish doing it as well so that your readiness and desiring may be matched by your completing it out of what you have. In other words, your speedy completion communicates your willingness and your eagerness to do this. All right? If you say that, oh, well, we are very desirous to do this, and you drag your feet in doing it, well, it really, people really wonder, right? Are you really you know, that, that committed to this uh, particular you know, project or not? But he was very careful, very careful. Sometimes, we, we, we listen to this kind of message. Wow, the Macedonians gave beyond their means. How does it make you feel? you feel very guilty. You're like, I also, I may also have to uh, uh, give beyond my means, you know, not just 10%, but maybe even 90% or whatever it is, right? We instinctively feel the pressure to be like them. We feel guilty if we are not doing what the Macedonians are doing. I mean, look, look at them. They're extremely poor and they can do this. Oh, look at me. I'm not extremely poor and I'm not giving them and we feel so guilty and all that. Pause and no, no, no. If the readiness is there, it is acceptable that you give according to what you have, not according to what you do not have. Okay? Paul do not, does not want the Corinthians to feel this way. He says there's no pressure to give beyond your means. All right? So if the readiness to give is there, it is acceptable that you give according to what a person has, not according to what you do not have. 
We call this the principle of proportionality. Come from the word proportion. All right? And it is consistent with Paul's initial instruction in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2, where he says, all right, if you want to go back there, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2, he says, On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and to store it up as he may prosper. All right, so there's no collection when I come. In a sense, you can say that this replaces the principle of the 10% tithe, tithing. The principle of proportionality replaces the principle of tithing, 10%. It does mean, with this principle of proportionality, that one does have the freedom to give more than 10% because he has more than enough to provide for the necessities of life. And it is common that with the increase of our wealth, we are also prone to increase the level of our living. It's just a, it's just a common thing. I mean, what you make, you pack your living around there. All right? So if, 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 it is, if it's here, it's like that. But if, you are, if your income is up here, you are living you know, in a more... You, you just, just you know, uh, up your standard of living. Okay? But perhaps... You know, when, you, when God has increased your, uh, 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 your, your wealth, God may also would like for you to increase the level of your giving. And um, one example comes to my mind. Okay, you may not know who this person is. Um, it's like, who's Paul, Paul Petz? Well, I'll give you an example. He was born in 1911 as the ninth of ten children born into poverty in the state of Wisconsin. That's where Miss Todd uh, grew up. He was a poor farmer, and when he was in his third grade, primary three, he had to drop out of school to start working in his family's farm. So he only had a primary three level education. Well, the Lord gloriously saved Paul Pets at age 17 as his personal Lord and Saviour. And the Lord started to put in him a burden for ministry, but he wasn't sure how God would use him. I mean, after all, he only had a primary three education, right? Remember, he was a farmer. And beginning in 1948, Paul Petz developed a series of inventions that would revolutionise the farming industry. He had a series of patents, all right, and actually led to his financial success. He founded Pets Corporation, still in existence today, all right? He died in 2000, all right, and, and has been consistently manufacturing uh, quality farming equipment to today. And he was wondering how God would use him, and eventually he felt burdened to uh, buy a plot of land to uh, begin uh, a Christian camp for young people, for youth, young people, children and youth. So he founded, his family founded, he and his family founded Northland Mission Camp in 1958 in Dunbar, Wisconsin, all the way up north, right? Very cold, very cold, very cold place. So then these people come through a camp, you know, they got saved, you know, they surrendered their life to the Lord and all that, and these, these young people started to grow older, and now he was wondering, so this, is a, this man grew up in the Great Depression, 1929. He was born in 1911. So he thought of what will happen to the kids who have trusted Christ. Where can they go to school? And the Lord laid on him, all right, to start a Bible institute, which later grew to become a Bible college, and uh, Northland Baptist Bible College was eventually started. And as God prospered him, he was able to give more and more of his company's profit into the ministry. So eventually, he purchased all the land, built all the buildings and so on. And even as God prospered him financially with the success of his company, Pets continued to live 
a humble and simple life marked by his growing up years during the Great Depression. Right? He didn't have much during the Great Depression, right? He also felt that he didn't need to have much now that God has given him. So he eventually, all right, he did not feel the need to increase his level of living, which meant that he was able to increase his level of giving, so much so that eventually he lived on a minority of his income, giving majority uh, of it away. I was able to talk to a friend who was an alumnus of a Northland Baptist Bible College, and um, the students like to call him, this uh, gentleman, Papa Pets. And he says that uh, this man always viewed his life as a stewardship, possessor of much, but owner of none. Yeah, it reminds me of what we talked about last week, that we, we all gave ourselves uh, to, uh, 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 to the Lord. All right? So here's an example of someone whom when the Lord increased his level of, uh, of our income, he didn't increase his level of living, he increased his level of giving. And we know that the Corinthian church is generally far wealthier than the churches in the regions of Macedonia. Uh, but, but Paul says what he says here in verse 12, uh, because there were those scattered among the congregation who would be slaves as well. They may very well have been giving out of their savings, all right? But their savings, probably they're saving up to eventually free themselves one day. And Paul is not asking for uh, the kind of giving that may jeopardize uh, that particular prospect, but, uh, that, but that pro proportional giving according to their means. All right, and then finally, we look at uh, verses 13 to 15. What do we have here? Paul says, For I do not uh, mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but that there, it's a matter of fairness. Your abundance at the present time should supply their need so that their abundance may supply your need, that there may be fairness. As it's written, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. Now, uh, what is Paul referring to here? Because I think, um, you know, uh, we can all, maybe what, the first thing that comes to our mind is, is, well, where is life fair? I mean, are, are we expecting to live in a communist uh, 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 utopia where everybody uh, makes the same amount and so on, you know? Uh, is that, is that what, what, what Paul is saying here when it's talking about fairness here? Well, before we jump into that, let's, let's have a very quick overview, all right? And you see here, our giving ought to be consistent with the biblical purpose for wealth, all right? It's what uh, I've entitled this uh, last three verses. Um, well, if our giving is to be consistent with the biblical purpose for wealth, then what is the purpose for wealth? What is the purpose for our having money in our bank account, okay? So let's look at these verses, all right? If you want to uh, flip to them, uh, you are definitely welcome to do so, all right? Why did God give us material possession, including wealth, all right? Now, some people say, well, it is to save for rainy days, we ought to save three months' income, and so on. Uh, we ought to invest them, you know, or it's for posterity to give to our next generation, and so on. But what does the Bible say about our wealth? Ephesians 4, 28 Paul says, let the thief no longer steal. All right? Why does the thief steal? Because he doesn't have work. So let him labor. Let him labor doing honest work with his own hands. For what reason? For what purpose? To save for rainy day, to invest and all that? No, no, no. So that he may have something to share with anyone in need. The reason for him to work is so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. All right? Next verse is in Acts chapter 20, verse 35. Here, Paul is writing to the Ephesian elders. He was going to depart Ephesus. And here are his parting words. And what does Paul tell them about really his own example in verse 35? Next reference here, verse 35. Paul says, in all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, okay, work hard, all right, and then the Lord will prosper you financially, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, how he himself says it is more blessed to give than to receive. 
right? So it is to help those who are weak and that at the end of the day, it is, you know, because why? Why does our Lord say this? It is more blessed to give than to receive because we all think that it's more blessed to receive than to give, right? Oh, wow, good, good. You know, someone give to me. That's a, that's, a, that's a blessing. Well, it is a blessing, but the greater blessing is bestowed upon the giver, all right? The giver. Okay. And, and we struggle with this, right? We struggle with this. When you give something, you suffer loss, you know. You suffer loss. But once again, if we, if we really can transform the way we think that everything we have belongs to God, then what loss is there? What loss is there? All right? And then finally, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 uh, to, uh, to, to 19, uh, Paul says, As for the rich in this present age, which I guess includes all of us, Charge them not to be haughty, proud. Look at how much I have and all that, right? I'm such an elite in this, in this society. Look at my, let me flaunt my, you know, latest and the greatest or whatever. Nor set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches. You know, I was gone only for a few weeks in Vietnam, uh, a couple weeks in Vietnam and then so many banks collapsed. Uh, I shouldn't be gone for so long. Yeah, that's a joke, that's a joke. It's a real man. No. But once again, it is the uncertainty of riches. But on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to, uh, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the future. And once again, you see here, he's going back and forth between spiritual riches and and, 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 and earthly riches, right? Because he's thinking, okay, you, you want to store up for the future and so on, right? But actually, this is the treasure, a, 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 a good foundation for our future so that they may take hold of what is truly life. So that is the purpose for our wealth, the biblical purposes. Now, is it wrong to save up for the future? Is it wrong to invest? Nothing wrong with that. But we need to be very clear about what the Bible puts as the primary reason. Um, now, this is how people usually feel. Wow, you know, yes, I may have more money than other people, but you know what? I don't want people to take advantage of me, right? Very common. I don't want people to take advantage of me. So in verse 13, Paul says, so I need to go back to uh, 2 Corinthians. Chapter 8. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burden. Wow. Just because I have a lot of money now, I have to shoulder, you know, look at all these poor people waiting for the handout. I feel very burdened. No, no, no. I, Paul says, okay, I don't want you to feel that you have a heavier burden to bear because you have more. Paul understands this concern, which is why in verse 13 he assures the Corinthians that the Jerusalem church is not going to get rich off their gifts. Right? You know? Uh, also, Paul is not asking the Corinthians to give more than the others simply because they are wealthier than the others. He makes no demand for... The, right up to this point. Never say how much you should give, how many percentage or whatever it is. All right? No demand. Just, you know, as, as to what you can. Paul is very careful in what he says to the Corinthians. Therefore, he's not placing an unequal burden on them. In fact, the word burden here in verse 13 is the same word translated affliction in verse 2. All right? For a severe test of affliction, that is exactly, exactly the same word. So I feel very afflicted, you know, you know, uh, that I have so much money and then you all want so much money from me and all that. All right? Now, certainly, giving by the Corinthians, even sacri uh, sacrificially, could hardly be compared with the kinds of severe afflictions the Macedonians experienced. But Paul wants them to give out an attitude of, of joyfulness. Not, ah, okay, I better give. Lah. You know, you don't people say something about me and all that kind of thing. <laughs> he doesn't want that at all. All right? You see, Paul is very, he has thought very carefully about the potential responses of people. And it's very sensitive towards how they would potentially uh, uh, respond. And then in verse 14, he says uh, in verse 14, 
uh, your abundance at the present time should supply their needs so that their, abun their abundance may supply your needs, that there may be fairness. Now, let's just talk about this. When we think about fairness, we are thinking in terms of material. You know, uh, in Israel, there are these settlements, these villages called the kibbutz. All right, today you can still go to Israel and there are still a few of those around, although uh, it is hard for them to survive nowadays. Um, so basically, whatever income you make goes into the village. You don't keep it. You don't keep it. It goes into this giant pool. Whatever you need, all right, the kibbutz will provide for you. And they take care of you from birth until death. All right? Uh, you know, and actually they say the kibbutz is a very good system because a lot of the very uh, accomplished people in Israel grew up in the kibbutz because they grew up while doing dishes one week, singing in their kibbutz choir the next week, uh, taking care of the elderly the next week. They have this rotation. So they are, when they come out into society, they are very well-rounded. All right? If they need to serve, wash dishes, they can do it. If they need to cook, they can because they, they have learned how to do it. They need to take care of the babies, they can do it. Take care of the elderly, they can do it. All right? uh, is that what Paul is, is, is recommending? All right, you put all together so that nobody has anything. Everything belongs to everybody. All right, you know, is that truly communist? I don't know. But it is common though, uh, uh, as in, you know, everybody share everything. Uh, but, but here, that is not what Paul is thinking actually. Uh, Paul is taking into consideration this equity or translated in the ESV as fairness. All right, it is important to clarify, Paul is not saying that they, ought, they need to give in order to create equality as a result. But they ought to give because they are already equal in the sight of God. Galatians 3.28 All men created equal before God, neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, no male or female, for you are all one in Christ. And it's on the basis of this equality that we must keep watch to make sure that no one is clutching to his abundance while watching another starve. Now, I think a very good cross-reference to what we see here is actually Romans chapter 15, verse 25 to 31. And I, yeah, I, I'm having you turn to a lot of, a lot of passages today, but uh, I think these are, we need to draw from other passages to really give illumination to what we are seeing here. But Romans 15, 25 Paul actually talks about this collection. Look at what he says there in 15.25. Okay? He says, this. now he's coming to the end of this letter to the Romans already. At present, however, I'm going to Jerusalem bringing aid to the saints. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what he's doing here in, in, in Corinth. All right? For Macedonia, okay? We talk about Macedonians, right? And Archaea, Archaea is where Corinth is located in. Have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. And now notice verse 27. For they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe these Gentile believers, owe it to these Jewish believers. In what way? For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings they ought also to be of service to them in material blessings. You see here, what's going on? Paul is actually, when you talk about riches, he's not just talking about material. He's talking about material and spiritual. And he says, it is because of the Jews, of the spiritual blessing the Jews have, and now, it is now spread to the Gentiles, and we, of all people, ought to be thankful to the Jews. It is right that we repay this spiritual blessing we receive with material blessing. So he's going all over the Jewish churches, uh, the Gentile churches, making up this, taking this collection, including the church in Rome. So you see here, so, so, so when we go, so this really helps us when we go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, all right? And in verse 14, your abundance at the present time should supply their need so that their abundance may supply your need. Not just talking about material wealth. Certainly includes spiritual blessings as well. All right, so that is the, in one sense, that is the fairness Paul is talking about. 
It's not that, you know, uh, you know uh, I make so much, you make so little, so I have to cut mine so that, you know, when we average out all the same, then I need to give you the difference. That's not what Paul is talking about here. In one sense, the Gentile believers owe a spiritual debt to the Jews, which they can, mater- which they can repay materially. All right? So that is why, let me advance the slides, which refuse to advance. All right? It's not moving. Can we advance it? Thank you. Okay, so that's why we see here, our uh, giving ought to be based on our equality before God, but next one, it's not, it's not working. Oops, now let's go. Okay, it is right to return spiritual blessings with material blessings, and that cross-reference, I think, is very important for us to understand uh, what we have here. Now, there will be the opportunity for future reciprocity, reciprocate, okay? So, uh, should the Corinthians have need in the future, perhaps the Jerusalem church might be able to meet their needs then. You never know, you never know, right? You never know. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, the, the fortunes may turn or whatever it is. And then now, he's going to quote, all right? He's going to quote from Exodus 16, verse 18. So, we're going to put that reference there. Where is he quoting from? Exodus 16, verse 18. Uh, and, and he says, okay, so, whoever gathers much, and in that context, it is gathering of what? Manna. Whoever gathers much manna had nothing left over, and whoever gathers little had no lack. Now, okay, I can see how that relates to uh, the equality thing and all that, but really, you know, what is the real, the real link here? I think we need to go back to Exodus 16 uh, to really see what Paul is driving at. It is not what he included in this passage. It's actually what he didn't include in the context. It is so important to go back to the context here. Exodus 16, all right? So, so here is food from heaven, literally, manna. All right? So look at verse 18. All right? Um, but when they measured it with an omer, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. Each of them gathered as much as he could eat. Moses said to them, Let no one leave any of it over till the, till the morning. Don't have any left over. Okay? Look at verse 20. But they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it to the morning and it bred worms and stank. Now you see what Paul is getting at? You see what Paul is getting at? I mean, I think a lot of us Singaporeans would be like, like them. Boy, let's keep some more you know, for, for tomorrow. Well, yeah, when tomorrow came, what happened? It's a pile of rotten mess. That is what Paul is saying. So here, Paul's point in bringing up this passage in Exodus is consistent with God's justice, demanding equality, trying to amass more than one's fair share, hoarding it, clutching it desperately, is really a futile waste of energy. We can share with others and still have no lack. Now, the point is always, how much, okay, so you say, uh, live on this enough and give the rest away, but how much is enough? That's the question. How much is enough? There is always an opportunity for us to increase to the next level of living, right? Especially in Singapore, there's no end, man. Uh, this week, you know, you know how the TikTok CEO you know, came to the spotlight? He was in the hot seat in Congress, US. Uh, then I think uh, some of the articles I saw, you know, uh, he has this good class bungalow, you know, out there, you know, probably costs like a, a, a gazillion amount of money and all that. Uh, how much is enough? What does the world say? Just a little bit more. And you know, that is the problem, right? That's the problem. For, for someone to actually say, you know what? I don't really need all this stuff. You know, that, you know, I've dropped this way and I'm fine. You know, I'm okay. Uh, how much is enough? Just a little bit more. I think something suddenly we can learn from this Israelites, you know, in the quotation here. But also, Scripture, we know, tells us that godliness with contentment is great gain. I mean, to just be calm and content 
with where we are in our station of life, instead of grasping, 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 right? So, timeless principles regarding giving, obligations that believers have to one another, especially those who are needy, is given to us here. And, you know, I've been, actually I've talked to some people and about this, especially with regards to, uh, you know, those who are in a situation of neediness. Uh, I think certainly there's a, a direct application to that, you know, how to improve uh, in our, in, in, in some of these aspects and um, it's something that we certainly need to look at. Uh, but obviously the Lord's timing is always perfect. And part of what it means to glorify him is to find ways by which we can help to meet uh, the needs of some saints who are in need of help. All right, so uh, to end today with personal reflection, what Christ-centered principle did Paul raise regarding our giving? In what ways does Paul display pastoral sensitivity in his interaction with the Corinthians on this subject? And is Paul's teaching regarding giving surprising to you? If so, in what ways? All right, so a good way to reflect. And once again, I told someone last week, once we are done in these two chapters, I'll forever hold my peace regarding this topic. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you teach in this area. We know when it concerns our pocketbooks, uh, things are sensitive. And, but uh, here are biblical teaching regarding uh, giving. And I pray, Father, that... Uh, you would uh, truly uh, work in our hearts. Um, really, 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 it is more of our attitude. <coughs> Are we giving joyfully? Are we giving willingly? Are we giving eagerly and voluntarily? It's all about the attitude. And if so, Father, then suddenly uh, the needs of saints we met, we will be willing to part with what is all yours, to meet the needs of saints, meet the needs of your kingdom, meet the needs of missions, and all of that for your honour and glory, the show of love, that really our Lord Jesus Christ has showed to us that we, have, we can in no way repay. It's just, uh, just a little bit of what we can do. So we thank you for all of this and what you have taught us in your word, for in Christ we pray. Amen. Okay. <coughs> now, closing hymn is uh, hymn 137, 137 in the hymnal. And uh, really, um, thanks, thanks, thanks. What is central to our consideration is what we saw just now in verse 8, verse 9. the example of Christ's uh, sacrificial giving of himself. And then in verse, in the fourth stanza, were the whole realm of nature mine? There were a presence far too small, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. That is, the demand is from the Lord, all right? Of my life, really, my everything. Uh, and from there, you know, I have the freedom uh, to be generous. Let's stand together. And, uh, and, and sing this, uh, this closing hymn.
be seated.